All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our seminar. Um, I'm Andre. I think most of you know me. I'm no longer chair, but she gave an excellent talk last week. So it was <laughs> awesome. Um, but I am here to welcome Birgit to our colloquium. Um, Birgit Penson Sattler used to be a postdoc here, for those of you who don't know that, for how many years? Two years. Two years, right? Yeah. Um, then hung around in various places in California for a little bit, but now is a professor at Chalmers University in Sweden and also at La Peranta University in <laughs> Finland. Um, and so um, she has long looked at sustainability and software engineering and is deeply concerned about our, <laughs> our collective future <laughs> in this world. Um, and today she's actually going to talk about something that is maybe less sustainability oriented, but still connected, um, which is really about, I would say, our own personal well-being. Um, so, Bridget, please take it away. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy that every one of you came here today. I feel honored. Um, I, I've sat in this room a bunch to listen to talks. <laughs> it's the first one I get to give here. <laughs> um, and this is actually very much part of sustainability. We um, may have just shared the, I think I just shared the wrong slide set. <clears throat> Speaking of sustainability, that's really funny. Yeah, that's the wrong slide set. Um, I'm gonna end this and sign back into the Google Drive account. This is ridiculous. <laughs> that's what happens when you accidentally use uh, the same, uh, the same, template for several slides. I'm sorry, that's going to take up a minute. So I'm going to entertain you a little bit by telling you that your mental well-being is very much part of sustainability in terms of its individual sustainability. So um, when, when we talk about sustainability overall, some people limit it to the environmental perspective. Other people see it very much as various perspectives. And in these various perspectives, please tell me you're actually on the Google Drive and not only on my laptop. <laughs> then we can also talk about a technical an economic and a social component and the individual component is underlying the social component because otherwise um, we got no society to build this on. Okay, so I did move it accurately from one folder to the next one, which is exactly where it was supposed to be. Moved it to the showcases for everybody folder and then, yeah, edited today. That's the one that we want. There we go. Um, so I'm just gonna present it on Google Slides anyways. Um, and I'm gonna reshare it on Zoom for the people who are watching on Zoom. Give me just a sec. Mm -hmm. Back to a wonderful presentation of Murphy's Law, everything I can go wrong in tech <laughs> definitely will, because that's the entertainment factor for all of us. And this is really why we do IT research, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we're going back to Google Slides. Maybe it's also just a secret measure of Google wanting me to use their slide presentation as opposed to anything else, any other viewer that we could possibly want to use. Uh, this one of the three view buttons and then we'll get back to the full screen there we are all right <laughs> now we really get started because as we are breathing deeply these days with all these wonderful masks on i thought this would be a wonderful way of putting my previous two lives into one life one of these lives is I'm a software engineering researcher who has done a decade of research in sustainability. The other life is I'm a yoga teacher and a breathwork instructor. And as people around me were getting more stressed out and everybody was locked up at home, I thought maybe some breathing could help. But let's dial it back for a moment as this thing is fighting me for the right presentation mode. So maybe you're familiar with the scenario of that stick figure on the right. A little stressed out. You've got a few paper deadlines, a review deadline, um, wash, rinse, and repeat. Uh, I, I like to give busy badges for that kind of thing. I have a feeling that many of you may have earned a lot of busy badges in your life. 
And then everything else going on on top of that, like COVID, work changes, home space, online fatigue, zoomed out. Anybody's been zoomed out this past year? Maybe a couple of people on the other side of the screen who are like, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, so we're familiar with that. Now, what does that do in our body? This is the medical part of the presentation. Don't worry, it's only one slide. Uh, so your parasympathetic nervous system is what is responsible for restoring you after you have been exposed to stress. And you see one of the biggest players is the vagus nerve. And on top of your kidneys, you see the adrenal glands. Now, when a stressful situation happens, whether that is traffic situation or something at work or some other concern in your life, what happens is adrenaline gets into the blood flow. And then at the brain barrier, scientists thought they'd make it a little more interesting and give it a new name, but it's the same stuff, epinephrine. Now adrenaline is called epinephrine and that goes into the amygdala. And from there in the hippocampus where the memories are stored, we're gonna do kind of a pattern matching of, have we dealt with that before? Oh yeah, stress, we know that pretty well. And so our system responds with this fight, flight or freeze mode. And as we continue to do that over time, in prolonged stress, those neuronal pathways get pretty ingrained. It's like a freeway in your brain to the old stress response, which means that over time, when more stress happens and you don't have enough time in between to settle down, you get a bit more frazzled. When you know, like the door slams closed and you're like, <gasps> That used, not to, that used to not make me jump. Why does it make me jump now? Oh, because I have a lot going on in my life and I'm already kind of nervous. So if that happens over weeks and months and maybe years, then we have serious um, consequences in our health for our sleep, our immune system, and we age prematurely. Welcome gray hairs. <laughs> now you may be wondering, wait, we're still at a we still at this informatics department? What? So what does that have to do with the work that we do here? Well, do you have your best ideas under stress? I, I rarely do. Do you make less mistakes under stress? I rarely do. And do you make better decisions under stress? Well, not me. Um, there are people who are specifically trained for that. Not the average software developer. Like Navy SEALs, yo, they are trained for taking good decisions under stress. So what do we do with that? This was also the doomsday slide. So this is all the stuff that can go wrong, but there is some good stuff. And the good news is that we can rewire our brain permanently. This is commonly known as neuroplasticity. There is a number of researchers amongst them, David Eagleman uh, from Stanford, who just wrote a book called Livewire, who said, neuroplasticity, that term was coined because we molded plastic and then it stayed in that form. So maybe that's not a great metaphor anymore. It's actually rewiring, constant rewiring of our brain. And now we can do that. We know that our brains constantly rewire. And so what if we could rewire that stress response that we've seen here previously on that slide to become more resilient? And we specifically do that by developing a higher vagal nerve tone. And that's gonna, first of all, increase how quickly we recover in a specific instance of stress. And it's also gonna increase our resilience over time. Now in detail, the benefits of that look like we increase concentration and cognition. We are more creative. We can become more productive. We have better communication and better mood and greater resilience. There is also a lot of medical fine print of what are the individual benefits for every single one of your organs in the body. And yes, it is deliberately in print size four, so you don't even attempt to read it. It's just that, yes, there is more good stuff that's happening, um, which I'm not gonna go into detail. Instead, the question is, because we're not in medical school, how do we do this? And the simple answer is to that we breathe, and it seems to have become more difficult these days evidence by me breathing hardly behind this mask. So you get to do your own self experiment throughout this talk of, oh yeah, I'm being very present with my breathing right now. Um, you breathe anyways, what's the big deal? Why are you talking to us about this? 
or most of the time, we breathe a little too shallow, which you notice when after about two hours behind your laptop, you get into that slump, brain starts working a bit slower. And you're like, I probably need a coffee. And then you go up, get into the kitchen, you're like, oh yeah, the coffee's really, actually I'm already better. And you realize, oh, okay, there was a lot just about the sitting and then the not moving enough and me breathing shallow that led to a lack of energy. We also don't breathe out all the way. And because we're so focused about what's going on on our screens, we tend to be more in our heads and not so much in the body. And our body gives us a lot of constant feedback about where we are. So the solution to that can be respiratory techniques. And the reason why I specifically look into respiratory techniques over some other ways of relaxation is some people are too anxious to even try and sit down and meditate. Some people may physically not be able to even try any yoga poses. It's not about being flexible, but if you're sitting in a wheelchair, then your yoga poses look a whole lot different than if you have two legs that you can walk with. We all need to breathe, otherwise we're not gonna stick around for very long. So maybe there is a way of how we can modify that and use that to improve our state of being. And this is the point where I wanna invite you to a little one minute experiment. I'm a researcher, I love self experiments. And I would love to invite you to try out one, the one breathing technique that I've specifically been working with here. May I have your permission to try that out? Yes, thank you, great. So I'm gonna demo it quickly and then we can all do it together. So this is a so-called three-part breath. The first inhale goes into the belly, second inhale goes into the chest, and then you exhale all the way. Sideways, inhale, exhale. Also the people at home might be hating me now because I keep walking away from the microphone. <laughs> My apologies. Um, so, Science has shown, specifically Andrew Huberman um, recently explained that in his podcast, he's a neuroscientist up uh, at Stanford as well, um, that this is one of the quickest ways, this is the quickest known way to relax the nervous system, this breath. If you've ever seen a little kid calm themselves down after they've been crying really hard, they go something like, <gasps> and then they're way more relaxed. So that's what this breathing techniques builds on. And so that's what we're gonna do just for a few rounds. So I wanna invite you to close your eyes just because we take in most of the information through our visual sense. And if we close our eyes, that means we have more sensory capacity to focus on the body. So first inhale goes into the belly, second inhale into the chest, and then exhale. I'm making sounds so you can hear it more easily. You may or may not make sounds. Inhale belly, inhale chest, exhale. Inhale belly, inhale chest, exhale. We'll do three more. Inhale belly, inhale chest, exhale. Belly, chest, exhale. Last one. Belly, chest, exhale. Good, keep your eyes closed for just a moment longer. I promise I'll stay here and just feel inside a little. Is there anything that maybe has shifted in your experience in how you feel right now? So maybe you notice that there is more space to breathe and you can blink your eyes open again when you like. Maybe it feels a little bit more freeing any difference that you would like to comment on, you can just pop it in. How do you feel different now, if at all? I can feel my heart. You can feel your heart. Good. You're alive. <laughs> you win. Yes, please. My head is clearer. Yes, your head is clearer. Yes. Uh huh. Anything else? Yes. I think I'm taking deeper breaths. Deeper breathing. Yes. Mm hmm. Just feel more sense of like calm. A sense of calm. calm. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yes, perfect. These and a couple more. So, I mean, essentially we've seen that list of benefits already on the slide before of what this stuff can help you improve. 
but we definitely see some like mental clarity, some calm, a better sense of what my physical body is doing. And so considering that that was one minute, could you imagine that being useful if you practice for a little longer? Yeah, maybe, maybe. That's what I thought. I mean, yeah, I'm an instructor in a technique. Obviously, I think that, which is why I set up this following research study that I want to show you. I'm going to try one more to go into, or maybe not. <laughs> I would still like to see the proper view of the slides, but you know, you just get the preview. No surprises in this presentation. You see all the slides beforehand. <laughs> so this practice is usually done laying down for the very simple reason that then you don't have to hold anything. You don't even have to try and sit up. You can just completely zone out and just focus on the breathing. Um, we put on an eye cover so that we have our attention really in the body as opposed to looking around who else is here. And there are many different breathing exercises for specific purposes. So this one, we usually breathe through the mouth because it's easier to breathe deep into the belly and it's easier to let go of the thinking mind. Most of the time, outside of this exercise, you always want to be breathing through your nose because that's what your nose is made of. And there's a lot of literature so showing that over the past couple of decades, we have seen a huge increase in allergies and in um, problems with the nasal cavities because people start breathing more through the mouth than the nose. So most of the time, nose breathing, best of all, only for the specific exercise, we do breathe through the mouth because it makes sense in that specific case. So what did you measure? If you say you turned this into a study, what did you actually want to look at? Well, I wanted to see if people feel those same benefits and what that translates to over the course of a few weeks. If after this breathing exercise, I feel more mental clarity, I feel more relaxed, I feel I'm better aware of my body. How is that going to affect my overall well-being in the long run? And so we had two runs that we have completed, September to December 20, and then January through March 21, where we got together once a week and practiced for an hour long session. And, um, oh, excuse me, too much carbonation. Um, we collected statistical data at the beginning and at the end on a number of instruments on mindfulness, on uh, positive and negative experiences, on personal well-being, and on positive thinking, self-efficacy, and productivity. So all the fancy abbreviations here, those are the names of the survey instruments that we used. I didn't want to develop any from scratch because that can take years to get to a valid scale. So I've reused really scales that already existed. And at the end, we threw in an IPIP, which is a personality test, because we wanted to know if for some people it works better of a specific personality than for other people. We didn't see any difference there, so we discarded that piece. And we also checked over the, over the weeks how their well-being changed. And that's the WHO5, the World, World Health Organization five question index. So you can fill that out within about 20 seconds and rate yourself in five criteria of how did you do this week? And because the numbers are not everything, we also ask them to journal a little bit every day about their experiences. Looking back, that was a really smart thing because there were some quantitative results where we were wondering, like, how does that make sense? And then once we looked into the qualitative data, we could make better sense of the numbers. So for any of you doing mixed methods research, that's why we do mixed methods, <laughs> quantitative and qualitative data. If one doesn't make sense, maybe the other one gives us a clue. <laughs> certainly was true for this study. And at the end, we did some interviews with people to make sure we asked them whatever we may not have caught in the surveys, whatever else might be interesting to them. Now the results. The results, first of all, we had about 250 signups and then about 50 finishers in both of those rounds together. Now, outside of saying, oh, you poor woman, your participants ran away. Um, the reason why I have this on the slide is because the main reason for people dropping out was, I'm sorry, I got too much on my plate right now. I know this would be really good for me to practice this technique for, you know, relaxing, but I can't relax right now. I don't have time for this. 
Um, that's me exaggerating the tone of the emails that I received. But that was indeed the main point that people were too busy, felt they had too much work to do. And I get it, I've been there many times. Um, so the main quantitative insights that we got were that people were more cheerful and in good spirit and more relaxed and calm and had an overall higher well being. A qualitative insight that we had that I thought was pretty cool, uh, considering tendencies that we've seen over the last two years in terms of mental health, was that we had several participants report who previously had a lot of anxiety and depression that they felt significantly better. That's just qualitative results because we didn't have uh, enough survey data to show that. It might be a reason for specifically looking more into that area and working with people who are experiencing that. Now, what did we ask them? So we had, oh, he said it's an old computer. So um, we looked into mindful attention awareness. That's a mouthful. What that means is how present am I in a moment and how aware am I of the fact that I'm being present? I could be giving a talk here and just completely be in that talk and not so much feel my body and be present with all of you. Mindful attention awareness is me giving a talk here and being present with you in the room in terms of making eye contact and also remembering that I have a physical body that has toes in shoes. Did you remember your toes until I said it? Um, <laughs> just a side remark. Um, so that's the construct of mindful attention awareness. And um, we had some funny results with that one because people actually rank themselves worse in a couple of those questionnaire items at the end than at the beginning. And that was one of the points you were like, how does that make sense? How can our study have made that worse? We'll get to that in a second. Um, then we had personal well-being in a number of aspects like positive and negative thinking, psychological well-being, sorry, positive and negative experiences and positive thinking, perceived productivity. Like we couldn't assess their work results in terms of objective productivity. We had them fill out the survey asking, how well did you think you did? Um, Self-efficacy, how good can I solve problems? And how confident do I feel about it? The daily perceptions of what were people thinking about and how did they go about their lives? And then how did they engage with the study? Now, because I am not a wizard when it comes to statistics, I engaged one of my wonderful colleagues, Richard Torkar, because at the end of the surveys, I said, what am I gonna do with this data? 80% of my participants didn't finish. Now I have, now I have 110 people who started and 20 who finished. Descriptive statistics tell me that this is completely useless. It was all for nothing. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Because there is based multi-level uh, multi models and they can deal with sparse data sets. So there is a way how they extrapolate with an algorithm to a large number of participants and you still get to statistically valid data at the end, luckily. Um, for those of you who are a little bit deeper steeped in statistics, we have made the code freely available, the R code, and it's also properly documented on GitHub. So this is replicable and we've made the quantitative data available as well. In this little graph, you see the, the surveys, so entry and exit that we use as comparison. And then we have one survey per week. And then we have one daily rating of how good was your day on a scale from one to 10. And one of the outputs that we had from the quantitative analysis were these weekly trends in terms of how cheerful did people feel? So we'll just use that as an example. And here you see a pretty good increase at the beginning and then a dip at the end. So that was one of the things we're like, huh? How does that make sense? And we'll get to it. Now, the one thing why I put that figure here is because at the end, you see the gray area, which shows the uncertainty of the results here. Um, that gray area became larger towards the end compared to the beginning because we had less survey answers at the end. So that's how you see that in the data that participants were dropping off. So therefore, more gray towards the end, higher uncertainty. We found a few other dependent variables 
in terms of gender, living situation, and age. Just to point out one, with advancing age, people tend to get a bit more relaxed and not thrown off so much by stressful events, individual stressful events. Where it became really interesting was when we folded in the qualitative analysis. So qualitative analysis is just the process of coding. In very simple terms, we read through the free text answers that people provide, and then we label it with how we make sense of that. And then we look at all those labels that we found and we group them into themes. And that's how we make sense overall of what people said. So I'm not gonna go into the methodical details of that. I put a little bit more on the slide in case you wanna read up on it in detail. Now, the list of themes that we came up with were general, generally around stress and discomfort. So they were reporting a lot about what was going on in terms of stress in their lives and self-governance. How did they deal with things in their lives as they came up and uh, work. There was a lot of talking about work this and work that. Now, in terms of our specific questions, you may remember I said, mindful attention awareness, it seemed to be going down. It was inconclusive. And the main reason for that was you don't know what you don't know in this case. So if you never reflected much about how present am I in my daily life, and then you practice that for 12 weeks, you also become way more aware of when you're zoning out. And so therefore we didn't see an increase in how people rated themselves. We did find some really cool quotes in the qualitative data in terms of, oh, time seems to expand as I feel more effective. That's kind of a pretty cool science fiction effect. Time seems to expand. And the old um, contemplative teachings from thousands of years ago, they tell us the only way how you slow down time is to become super present in the moment. And maybe you've had that experience in a flow moment, in a peak experience, but that's for another talk. I could go down a rabbit hole here. So, and the other part was, I can pinpoint parts of my body that I hadn't realized were sending me signals. So people also became more aware of what was going on in their physical bodies. For the second question, well-being, we differentiated that a little bit. Um, so we see a general increase in them scoring their day over time. And we see the weekly trends with the dips at the end that we couldn't make sense of. And the weekly dips were mainly for a plateau effect reason. So after I've trained a new technique for a few weeks, eventually I've kind of gotten it. So I'm at a new better level now and I'm kind of plateauing. And because I'm plateauing, I don't feel like I'm improving. So I'm gonna end up rating myself a little worse. So that's where those dips came from. Thank you, qualitative data. Otherwise I would have been <laughs> really confused by that. Um, and then for positive and negative experiences, we mainly saw that people notice a little more the positive things in their lives. So first of all, participants noted, oh, this has really helped change my very negative mind and I can stay calm and I also notice other positive things. So both of those two. In terms of psychological well-being, we saw an increase in the quantitative score and then a couple of really beautiful insights like I'm happy that I'm aware of my strengths and weaknesses and I've learned that we all have a purpose. That's good. Self-worth is one of the biggest things in mental health that for some reason we, we think there's something wrong with us or that we're not worthy enough for something. The bottom one is one of my favorite quotes of the study. Generally, things are good. Took a while to get here, but adulting has finally paid off. <laughs> so, yo, adulting, there we go. Adulting being a rough translation of me deciding to take good care of myself. That's essentially what it is. Um, so maybe it's also self-parenting, adulting, self-parenting, whichever way you want to see it. Still my favorite quote. There was an increase in positive thinking. So first participant on the slide, participant 11, said they suffer from obsessive compulsive uh, disorder. And there are aspects that they can now better deal with. For example, letting thoughts just pass through. We had this one quote of don't believe all your own thoughts. 
it's a pretty good rule to go by. I have a lot of shenanigan thoughts going on in my head all day. I don't know about you, but like, I own that there's a lot of shenanigans in here and that it's a better way to go through life to not all believe all of those thoughts. Um, second one participant, I find joy in silver linings and in lifelong learning. Um, and then the third participant on the slide also said, oh, I've, I've grown a lot over the course of the study. So um, all of that is good. Now, when I go to the IT industry and I tell them how important breathing is, they're like, yeah, 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 but what about productivity? <laughs> so the reason why this is in here is not because I want to convince anybody to go sit down and breathe so then we can squeeze out a little bit more work productivity. No, I see it the other way around. I need the productivity aspect in here to get companies to buy in because in the end, those are also all good people and they got to watch their bottom line. So if they're going to invest in something that also needs to be on a return. So what's the return for the companies that can be better um, health of their employees and can be better productivity. The quantitative data here granted is inconclusive. The qualitative one is positive. So people have found it easier to refocus, to prioritize and to also have self care actions in their daily lives. So I see it more as a side effect of taking good care of myself, that I'm also more productive. And it's one of the open questions of how we can show this a little better. That's part of the future work. Self-efficacy, mainly how confident do I feel in dealing with the world? And we've had a couple of positive answers here that I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on because I'm really curious about all your questions on this. So we just see some positive results and let's, let's take that last one. I think that's really cool because you might be able to take that away for your own daily work. I tried the technique of visualizing where I wanted to be in that conference and noticed how my entire attitude changed. And so we know how we influence people that we have a meeting with by the energy that we bring into that meeting. So if I'm really clear on what is my intention for this meeting before I start it, then the outcome for everybody can be better. So that's one very concrete thing that somebody took away here. In terms of daily perceptions, we saw there was a positive trend over time. Statistically, not necessarily conclusive. We did see a lot of positive reflections in the journals over time. And people focused more and more on gratitude in their reportings. They became more reflective. So at the beginning, somebody might write, yeah, you know, just a normal day. And at the end, they would be way more specific in just reflecting on what they were perceiving and also taking responsibility for their own experience. So instead of blaming a colleague for something they had done, um, they would say, well, I was really grumpy. And then like the colleague kind of snapped back at me. Things like that, small and significant for how we feel in our days. And something that we found really interesting was there are some psychedelic experiences in breathing. It can make you feel like you're floating. Um, some people were reporting some, some visuals, but what I find way more relevant for communicating the outcomes of the study is there are participants who managed to deal better with anxiety. Like this person managed to relieve a growing panic attack with the breathing exercises and somebody else feels more compassionate about other beings and somebody else is more relaxed and willing to take on whatever comes their way. Now, how did they engage? very differently. There were people who showed up for one or two sessions um, and then dropped off. And there were people who stuck through the entire thing. So you see a big drop off in terms of how many people filled out their journals. Some people say they will stick with it. Other people wanted to stick with it and they may or may have not since the study. We do a longitudinal follow-up. We send them another one every three months to just check in. Hey, have you actually continued doing this? Like, do you still feel any benefits from it? And then again, maybe it's going to help with anxiety management over time. Um, the press has picked it up from San Francisco, which I found really cool. Somebody found the article on archive and sent me an email asking if they could write about it and had a few additional questions. So I hope this might be getting out there a little bit. So as a quick result, you see the research questions here on the left, quantitative, half of them is supported and the other half is kind of inconclusive. For all of them, we did find qualitative support. 
and we're currently running the third of this one, uh, the, the third run with again, 100 signups and we'll see with how many finishes we end up in this one. And while there has certainly been a lot of people who dropped off, others said they took away a whole new world. So I'm not gonna pretend that this is the thing for everybody. I have seen that it has made a significant difference for some people. And so what's here to take away? Um, you can look up the article on archive, it's currently under review. And what I am specifically interested in, what I've gotten as questions is how can we, in a meaningful way, show how this could make a difference within IT development, within software development. And if I look at the world at large, like why are software developers so important amongst everybody? Because we're developing the systems that run the world. So there is a big piece where we kind of infuse our, our values into the systems we build and therefore I am under the opinion, under the impression that software developers could be great role models. Like if we take good care of ourselves as software developers and then that goes into the software systems that we put out there, that could be a change for the good. Um, outside of my own speculations about future work, I'm really curious to hear your questions. So thank you very much for sticking through this with me. <laughs> Yes, please. Thank you for the talk. Really interesting. So, as I kind of contemplate how you get software developers to use these techniques, um, and I'm thinking kind of from the organizational perspective, kind of how how would you implement this intervention? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's a good question because there have been efforts of that kind in a few of the big players and. I'm sure many smaller companies, but from, from a couple of the big ones, I, um, I spoke to somebody who ran a mindfulness program at, at Google, for example, and one of the troubles that we see in these programs is the preaching to the converted. So there may be people picking it up and actually really benefiting from them who are already aware of their mental health and that they wanna do something for it. So that in itself may still be a good thing. And there is a lot of people out there that are just gonna, um, let it fall to the wayside or not respond to it, that may also very much benefit. There is no way how I can make people care about something that they don't care about. So there is either um, them at some point being in so much pain that they want to do something about it, or there is a general raising of awareness. And for an individual person, breathing techniques may or may not be the answer, as long as they find something for themselves that helps them relax. Like if they want to jump on their bicycle and ride after work, or if they want to go run or um, whatever activity it is, as long as it's something that is good for their mental well-being, I'd be all for it. So I would say um, the raising awareness part as much as offering little things and then seeing who picks it up and getting feedback on what if that was good and what else would you like might be a way to go about it. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I think you may have touched on this already, but like during your actual study, were the breathing sessions as a group or individually? And if so, if they were individually, did they do them themselves with like help through a breathing coach or like how did that individual mm -hmm. partake in the, the study? How yes. Did like, the thing you brought in? Yes, great question. Uh, and I actually did not explain it during the talk. So thank you for asking. Um, the breathing sessions were offered live in a group session on Zoom. And then for anybody who could not make that specific day and time, we had a recording that was accessible only to participants. So if you couldn't come on a given day, you could just watch it the next day or the day after and do it by yourself. And for after the study, I provided them with a recording that they could use at any time when they wish. Um, and so it was a group setting and it was remote which has several effects. So there is a dynamic in group settings. So sometimes group courses really help to keep the cohort together and keep everybody motivated, which kind of goes away when you're only online and remote. On the other hand, it gives you more privacy. So 
another thing about bringing this into workplaces is how willing am I to be seen in a vulnerable position, whether that is an upside down yoga pose or that is me laying on the floor and breathing. Um, so that is also something that I'm very aware of. Did that answer all of your questions? So that was the general setting. Yes, that's really my first question. Okay. Uh, so my second question, what was your target age group and demographic? And do you think, the answer, my answer in those, do you think that had an effect on how many people stayed on or um, mm -hmm. improved your results of any kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So um, we had participants from age, was 18 or 19, I'm not sure, I think 19 to early 70s with the larger percentage in their 20s and early 30s. And I believe the reason for that is um, it was a, a mix in between um, distributed network outreach and convenience sampling, because in the end, all of these people are connected by up to three links from me. Like I sent it out to a network of colleagues that I knew, to all my alumni from different countries and um, to several international research um, mailing lists. So there was a large share of academics in the study. The only uh, inclusion criterion was, initially I wanted only software developers. I didn't get enough participants. So I opened it up to uh, people who spend at least 70% of their work time in front of a computer. Um, so that includes a whole lot of, the, lot of IT workers and I had digital artists in there and different kinds. Um, so there was a large percentage of students as well. And overall, the sample is not large enough to statistically say these are some reasons why they dropped out. So the main reason that I know of is that people just had too much on their plate. And so after a while, they were like, well, that's an easy thing, easy thing to drop. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I would expect that to increase actually for a number of reasons. Let's take a let's take a positive case. The team gets along well. Like if there is a lot of <laughs> fights within that team, there might be side effects that are, I don't know, even that might be solved. Who knows? But if we say this is a team that generally does not worry about being in this vulnerable space of laying on the floor and breathing together, if they're okay with that, then um, the simple fact of doing this together can strengthen the team in itself. And then as everybody is in a better mental um, and energetic place, then that could certainly have effects in the productivity. And there is clearly a researcher bias. Of course, that's what I'd like to believe. And what I see indicated in the data, I can't prove it. So, so far are my insights. And I'm still looking for a team willing to take that on and really try it out. Like I've had a couple of people from various companies join. Um, we also have a um, research network with Swedish companies in Chalmers that we can like send invitations like that to. Um, I've not had whole teams sign up. I've had individuals from companies sign up. So yeah, that would be a great next step. If you know a company that really, really wants to do this, let me know. <laughs> yes. Great question. So first of all, the people who didn't like it, they probably didn't show up anymore. And so therefore no more survey answers. So yes, that is definitely a bias that tends to be in qualitative data of that kind. And um, the ones that I happened to know personally, I followed up with and main reason again was dropping out for too much on the plate. Um, I didn't find any specific negative feedback um, in terms of, I felt that it has somehow decreased my well-being in any way. There were one or two people who said, 
I don't quite see the point. Mm -hmm. So I'm not pretending this is a greatly working thing for everybody. And it's more of, if it can help a significant share of people, that's great. Everybody else, well, they spent a couple of hours breathing, could be worse. <laughs> so um, I have not found any negative side effects. That said, there is a specific set of conditions where you may not want to do it. And I say that at the beginning of every session, and I also say during recruiting, if you had a recent diagnosis for bipolar or schizophrenia or PTSD, then you could have a big emotional release when you do these breathing exercises. And that can be a helpful thing, but not if you're breathing alone, alone at home in front of a computer and I'm far away. So that could be a good therapeutic measure if you are doing a one-on-one -on -one session with somebody who's physically present for you, um, for you in that moment. And that's exactly how I explain it in the studies, because it's not like I want those people to walk away. Like They obviously have a mental condition that would be good to be treated. It's just not the right setting for me to do it with them in the group. Um, yeah, but so there could be emotional releases. So let's say if it is somebody who does not have a previous mental condition, if I lay down and I become really present in my body and I breathe for a while, and then I have an old feeling come up of a previous experience that was not nice, I may have to deal with that old feeling again. Same for positive feelings. So in that sense, we could say, yeah, maybe somebody will go through a rough moment in that. And that could be facilitated by the breathing technique. There is no guarantees for it being one way or another. And it's the internal experience that we already bring to it. So it's nothing that gets layered on top of it. It's more like a mechanism that helps you um, dust off some stuff that may have just got covered over under dust. Yes, I saw several hands out of the corner of my eye over here and then. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk, I really enjoy it. Um, I was just trying to pick your brain around. Um, it's like a one minute we heard people report that even one minute was really helpful. And I know in a lot of watches they do their breath thing and just what's your take on um, like frequency or length or, you know, mm -hmm. just the structure of it, just given thinking about like, like the people who say, oh, I just don't have time for it. Like, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about that? So um, the once a week longer session can be a really good reset. And if people say they don't have the time for it, 10 minutes might be great. Like if I do 10 minutes of that at the end of my day while laying in bed, if I fall asleep at minute five, no big deal. That means my body <laughs> needed sleep more. And it's actually a really good help to go to sleep. So it can also help falling asleep for people who, who have trouble with that, with uh, unwinding in the evening. Um, there are specific breathing techniques for different situations. So there are some that you could use in the morning to get your energy flow going. And this is one that you would maybe rather use at night to unwind and calm down. Um, could be a good reset in between two stressful meetings just to do a couple of minutes of it. Um, so it's almost like whatever you can comfortably fit in, there is no, it needs to be minimum that. Because we, we felt a difference within about a minute like even if a slight one. So if I got three minutes, great, maybe I can do three. Mm. Have you thought about different ways of either incentivizing or presenting it so that it's like, I'm not signing up necessarily for four weeks, but maybe for a five day challenge? Mm -hmm. um, I can get people to do it for shorter periods of time. The thing is, how significant are gonna, uh, is the data gonna be that I get out of it? Like if people breathe a few minutes, they may feel better. Is this going to lead me to significant data that would show something? I guess I was thinking sure. of like chaining it together. Even. So one reason I mentioned yeah. this is we did a mindfulness meditation breathing app for the watch and our initial uh -huh. model, just under our medical model required participation. And the uh -huh. more we did that, the more we felt we were maybe causing harm. Or now you've got to right. do this. Uh -huh. So that we started to go more optional, but then figure out, well, what are the ways to like chain together optional? Right. Uh -huh. I think that chaining together is a really good idea. I, I might pick that up. So I thought about incentivization and I'm finally at the point, it took me only four months of administrative paper trail to be able to do little incentives like a gift card. And then you also know, well, maybe you're introducing a bias with that. So 
So I'm, I'm not sure how much I like that or not. We'll see. And I might definitely consider that. I have repeaters. Like I have people who signed up for number two after they did the first study. So for eight plus 12, <laughs> which I think is a good indicator. And that obviously wasn't everybody. That was a handful. So um, thank you for that suggestion. And then I think you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Fascinating topic. Um, I'm wondering, so it sounds like the lying down is both an important part of the exercise and a big hindrance to people trying it in the workspace, um, whether that's because of vulnerability or just being able to get up and do it. Um, how drastic are the differences in data when you have people lie down and when you have people just sitting at their desk? Um, it's mainly about the being able to fully relax. So if I may demo. Yeah. Me relaxing fully on this chair looks like, <laughs> and then after about three minutes, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm getting uncomfortable. <laughs> so um, I think that's a really good point. So there are other breathing exercises where um, you can make it way simpler. Like you could have a, a small set of, say, three to five minute interventions that people can do at any point during their workday. And that may be a future study. For this specific technique, just because the relaxation effect is supposed to go so deep and completely reset your nervous system, um, that's only possible laying down. And there are other pl plenty of other techniques that we can practice sitting or even standing. So yeah, I, I may pick that up for one of the future ones. Thank you. And then there was one more hand up over here somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah. So Constance asked one more question I was going to ask. Um, I noticed that uh, in the paper you talked about like uh, some, there's some change, but there was some informational material as part of the section or kind of mm -hmm. learning, I'm guessing. It's a good question for several reasons. First of all, I may have accidentally introduced a bias because now how am I going to tell how much of it was the laying down and breathing exercise and how much was the 10 minutes talk of me just talking to people to help them get into a mind state where they could be a little more relaxed. So my additional idea was I'm going to need to talk to participants for about 15 minutes until they forgot most of what the work day has been previously so they are relaxed enough to even start their breathing practice. And then it turned out in the qualitative data, they really liked, like some of them really liked the content. Other people didn't like it at all. They were like, oh, you know, I kind of, I kind of suffered through that part because I read enough about it and the breathing was really helpful. So I had both of those flavors and I may in the future just um, separate the two. So essentially there is a wind down period that is needed to just get people to chill a bit because most drop whatever they were doing before to just be there on time for the start of the session. And therefore that unwind talk is important. And the content was not really so significant in terms of what we measured that just showed up in the qualitative data because that's what we talked about. I, I would be curious to talk more about these transition periods and how one would define those to facilitate the breathing participation. Yes. If that's necessary. Yes, absolutely. Um, like in the instructor training for the specific breathing technique, like we talk about what that structure looks like for the unwinding talk, and that's different in a group from, from individuals. And yeah, I'd be happy to talk more afterwards. Mm -hmm. and then I saw another hand raised here. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering, have you ever like experimented with where they do the exercise if they do them from home? Because I've like experienced, for example, if I am, especially when we have a lot of online stuff, online learning, and you're in your room all day, mm -hmm. your room kind of becomes this space of, stress like where you know yeah like where your desk is for example like you know that's where I do my work and, like that's my place it's like yeah and so like sometimes even like going into the living room of my apartment like leaving my room relieves some sort of stress so mm -hmm. I was wondering like if you have these at home like recordings or, or like you do it over zoom like have you thought about like telling them where to do it um, yes, great question, because I lived in a studio apartment for a year while this thing, and I could see my computer from my bed. Not a good setup, <laughs> like not. <laughs> um, there was the encouragement to find, to find a space a little bit separate from workspace, and it also had to be a protected space where people wouldn't be interrupted. So if we're talking about a shared apartment, the living room may not be a great option, because then another room you may be walking in and out because they just happen to come home. 
Um, so I left it up to the individual and I don't really have data on it. Um, it is very relevant that a person feels safe because otherwise they can't fully relax into the technique. And apart from that, um, it becomes more immersive when you put it on headphones, just so you can zone out a little more as opposed to it coming from a blaring speaker over there. And I think it's interesting in connection to, do we do it in a dedicated space like a yoga studio? Or do we do it in the privacy of our homes where there may be other stuff distracting us? So yeah, thank you for that. I think there was one more hand here and we're also probably running out of time. One more. <laughs> it was me, I have kind of a harder question now. Yes, <laughs> oh, <great. Bring> <laughs> um, So I'm curious, so I, this was initially studying that it was self, you know, people were choosing it. But if you were to do a kind of a workplace intervention, I think one of the things I would ask is what would you say to somebody who would suggest that these kind of workplace interventions of this sort may be helping people in small ways, but are not, um, but they're also training the body to be better workers. So it's like training the body to labor more. And then mm -hmm. how would you, and, and then in that way, serving the institution or the organization at our expense in some ways. So how mm -hmm. would you make sense of this kind of the individual benefit versus a more critical theoretical perspective of creating a body to work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a good point because I need the organization to buy into the thing to be able to facilitate the intervention. And um, I know from my experience so far that the well being increases a ton and the productivity is a byproduct. So the question is, how do I phrase this for both of them? And the most effective thing that I've found so far is I don't argue with the productivity, I continue to say that's a side effect. What it does make it a buy-in for the organization, nevertheless, for the well-being is we're going to decrease sick days and we're going to decrease burnouts and we're going to increase employee retention because people feel better here working here. And so that way people see, okay, the company really cares. I have gotten a cynical comment in that uh, register article um, from a developer saying, well, you know, <laughs> if I look at my email inbox, urgent deadline number one, urgent deadline number two, HR department, we really care about your mental health. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I see that thing as well. Yes. <laughs> thank you. All righty. Well, thank you for a lovely talk. Thank you for lots and lots of questions. Also, thank you to the, the Zoom participants. Uh, yes. 20 of them joined remotely. Wonderful. Um, I hope they also joined in the breaking exercises. Um, yeah. You almost made me fall asleep. I know, it really is. <laughs> so, thank you, Bridget. And I think we have some questions outside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.